Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Lindley Barbie for coming back and giving another talk for our ECHO program. Dr. Barbie is part of the infectious disease faculty here and also works for King County Public Health and the HIV STD Prevention Training Center, and I will turn it over to Lindley. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me back. Um, I was here in December and we did some basic STD cases in HIV primary care. Um, and this time I thought I'd go a little bit more complex. Um, these are kind of zebras, but something worthwhile to keep in the back of your head um, related to HIV primary care. So I'm going to do it case-based. Um, the first one is a 43-year-old man, um, MSM. He's got stage 3 HIV. Last CD4 was 230. He's been on um, Truvada boosted Darunavir for about three months and has gotten his viral load down to about 120, but not undetectable yet. He came actually to the STD clinic. He'd also presented to his primary care doctor a few weeks prior, but um, he had a rash. He said it had this rash for about three weeks and he actually described it as tumors because it was kind of nodular and firm on his buttocks, his scrotum, his thighs. And he said some of those tumors kind of have some pus in them, some of them are scabby. Um, early on, his primary care doctor had treated him as ringworm um, with some topical antifungals, and that did not improve. Um, at this time, he had no fever, lymphadenopathy, other systemic symptoms, or anything else going on. He doesn't have too much past medical history beyond HIV, a history of neurosyphilis a couple years ago, and some genital warts. He is sexually active um, with male sex partners about eight in the past 12 months both tops and bottoms. He's not great about his condom use. Um, and he does use meth. So when we saw him on physical exam, um, he did have some inguinal lymphadenopathy. And he had multiple of these lesions um, that kind of looked a little bit different in different areas. So same distribution that he had described, um, one on the right hip, two large ones on his left anterior thigh, um, some on the buttock and the scrotum. Some of them, mostly on the buttock, were kind of small, nodular, one to two centimeters, with a little, some had some pus coming out, some had already scabbed over. On the left anterior thigh, he had um, two large patches that were erythematous, pretty well demarcated, um, and in the center, um, there were multiple kind of areas of pus or scabbing, depending on kind of evolution, um, and it was kind of nodular and indurated, as you could see. This is similar to his, this is not um, him, but this is kind of similar. It's hard to appreciate how nodular they were um, in this picture, but definitely could feel it under the skin. Some of that pus you can see. Um, he was a little bit more scabby on some of his lesions as well. The image you're seeing on the left is not him, and that is in a very extensive version of this uh, disorder. But the one on the right is very classic for the, the two lesions he had on his left anterior thigh. Um, that red, very well demarcated patch um, with some scaling, scab, and evidence where that he had had pus, he had pus on his, but. If you got the instructions to text in your idea for the differential diagnosis, um, is this, so just to recap real quick, we've got a 43-year-old guy, stage um, three HIV, recently back on medications, is this disseminated fungal infection, MRSA, syphilis? Is this a cancer, either squamous cell or Kaposi's? So can you all see the percentages? So we've got 15% um, think this is a MRSA infection and 85% think this is syphilis. So I will say that at the first time that he was seen, after the ringworm diagnosis, obviously, the, um, we did think this was maybe a MRSA infection. I think it, um, that is certainly high on the differential. We did do, um, so he was treated for MRSA and tested for STDs routinely. And his RPR did come back at 1 to 5, 12, quite high. And when he came back to see us um, for treatment of his syphilis, his rash had not improved despite being treated for uh, MRSA or a strep infection. He was evaluated for neurosyphilis. He had some tinnitus, but he's a little bit of a difficult patient and refused to have an LP. So we started to empirically treat him for neurosyphilis. So anyway, this is 
a case of um, Louise Maligna or malignant syphilis. So Louise Maligna is a variant of secondary syphilis um, that is noted by very well demarcated lesions with a nodularity um, very similar to what you're seeing in this patient. Usually di diagnosed by a very high um, titer on the RPR, um, usually a severe gerish herxheimer reaction. Microscopically, if you did a biopsy, there are char characteristic features um, that have a lot of plasma cell infiltrates and typically resolves um, with syphilis treatment very rapidly. Um, notably about Louis Maligna, which we don't see all that often, it is associated with HIV um, up to 60-fold increased risk um, with HIV, and that is independent of your CD4 count. So there was recently a great case series in sexually transmitted diseases by an author called um, Maldonado Sid, um, if you want to look it up. But anyway, it was in three or four HIV positive patients. All of them had CD4 counts way over 200. One had a CD4 count of about 1,200 and um, had Louis Maligna. So associated with HIV, regardless of CD4 count, just a variant of secondary syphilis will resolve with treatment. Moving on to case number two. This was a 32-year-old uh, male, stage three HIV, CD4 count under 100, viral load 80, 1,000, he'd not come back for his labs um, at this point, but had just been put on AAA about two or three months ago. He was also on Bactrim for his low CD4 count, and he's presenting with a penile ulcer. He said this ulcer's been present for about three days, and it reminds him of the last time he had primary syphilis. It didn't really hurt at all, except when it got stuck in his underwear and he kind of had to pull it away. Um, and he is sexually active with men, both insertive and receptive anal sex and no oral sex. The first time that he came in with this ulcer, I think that everybody, he, the clinicians who saw him did the appropriate thing and presumed that this was primary syphilis, treated him, test, tested his RPR, um, and tested him for other um, STDs, gonorrhea and chlamydia. And when his rectal chlamydia came back positive and he was called with this result, he said, you know, I, I think the ulcer is getting a little bit better with that penicillin. And his RPR was 1 to 64, which was actually the same as his last RPR, so that's kind of hard to interpret, but if it was primary, it may not have bumped anyway. So it, we thought this was a done deal, that he was treated, but he came back about eight weeks later and said, you know, it seemed to get better initially, but it hasn't improved at all in the past eight weeks, and I still have it. It doesn't hurt. Um, but I'm concerned. And so on physical exam, you can see it here. Um, it's a small, clean-based, superficial ulcer, um, just proximal to the glands. It's got some raised borders, a little bit of crusting, um, and we actually did find a single and large lymph node in his left inguinal region. What does everybody think this is? We've got a 32-year-old gentleman, stage three HIV, newly on treatment. Um, sexually active with men who has a persistent genital ulcer. Is this herpes? Is this syphilis? Is this a squamous cell carcinoma? Shankroid or lymphogranuloma venereum, LGV? So we have a very nice distribution here. Um, a little over a third think it's herpes, a little over a third think it's shankroid, 14% uh, syphilis, and another 14% LGV. Let's talk about the differential diagnosis in a persistent genital ulcer. Um, we can kind of divide this into both infectious and non-infectious etiologies. Infectious, um, certainly keeping herpes on the list is um, not unreasonable, though I think with a man whose CD4 count is coming up, he's on tenofovir treatment, um, pretty unusual for him to have a herpes lesion, a singular herpes lesion that's not painful to last you know, eight weeks. So I'm going to actually take that one off the list. Syphilis, you know, he was treated, his RPR hadn't risen. It's definitely possible um, that he didn't respond to treatment. We'll keep that one on the list. Shankroid or Haemophilus ducreyi, extremely rare in the U.S. I don't actually think that there's been a case reported in a number of years that has not been imported from somewhere else. Also would have been covered with the zithromycin. So one gram of zithromycin would have treated that. So I would take the shankroid off. Lymphogranuloma venereum, um, LGV, a, a serovar of chlamydia trachomatis, also not very common in the U.S. And when it is seen in the U.S. or West, it's usually seen as proctocolitis 
in um, MSM, but certainly can present as a persistent genital ulcer um, with inguinal lymphadenopathy. So we'll keep that on the list. Davenosis or granuloma inguinale, um, also extremely rare in um, Western, uh, the West, and usually the ulcers there are more destructive um, to the genitalia and they grow um, and cause some more fistulas and whatnot. So I'm taking that one off. Let's think about it. The non-infectious causes squamous cell carcinoma, while extremely rare of the penis, is extremely rare in the general male population, about 0 0.3 to 0.5% overall. In HIV, that risk increases about eightfold. I think it's certainly something you would not want to miss and I would keep on my differential. Bichette's autoimmune phenomenon, usually, see, usually painful ulcers, usually in, you have other systemic symptoms or particularly oral ulcers to go with that. So I think I'd take Bichette's off. Certainly can see traumatic lesions um, to the genitalia, although eight weeks later, I would expect that to have resolved. Fixed drug, drug eruption of the genitalia often seen, particularly with Bactrim, which he is on. The cases of fixed drug eruption that I've seen with Bactrim usually don't, you don't look like that single little tiny ulcer. They're usually more painful, red, and inflamed. And then psoriasis, I just don't think this one goes with psoriasis. So I think the top three on our differential at this point are syphilis, LGV, and squamous cell carcinoma. So I think a lot of you are right on target there. So what did we do with this patient and what are things we could think about? So um, I think when you're in the real world, even though we eliminated some of those things off the differential, we need to continue to to just rule them out officially. So he got a herpes PCR of the ulcer. We repeated his RPR. We sent a bacterial culture, including um, a request for Haemophilus ducreyi to rule out chancroid. And we swabbed the ulcer itself and sent it for a chlamydia gnat. Um, you may not want to tell your lab you're doing that because they may not run it if it hasn't, um, if they don't have clear approval for it. And then we decided to empirically treat him with acyclovir because it's pretty benign and if, if it would make it go away, that would be great. Repeated his penicillin treatment just in case. And um, we didn't do this originally, but I think it would not be unreasonable would be to start doxycycline BID. 21-day um, course would be what we would use for LGV. And we also put in a derm referral for consideration of biopsy and second opinion. And what came back? His PCR for HSV was negative. His RPR, RPR was lower, um, so this was not syphilis. The, unfortunately, the bacterial culture became overgrown with MRSA and we could not rule out H. ducreyi, but as I said, I didn't think that was very likely to begin with. And he, he had not seen dermatology yet, as this was only about a week later. But what did come back positive was his swab for chlamydia. And um, while this is not diagnostic of LGV, it's highly suggestive of LGV, and you can do a second swab from the ulcer and send it to the CDC um, to do serovar testing to confirm that it's LGV. Um, LGV, I mentioned very briefly, cause, can cause genital ulcers as well as proctocolitis, caused by the serovars L1, L2, L3 of chlamydia trachomatis, um, can present as a painless lesion at the site of inoculation, and then you develop inguinal lymphadenopathy with or without abscess formation or proctocolitis. This is highly endemic in Africa, Asia, South America, and the Caribbean. We don't really see it in the US or in the West, except Europe has been seeing um, more and more reports of LG proctitis among HIV positive MSM. And actually in this month's sexually transmitted diseases, where you can see where I do a lot of my reading, um, is a great case report of um, um, HIV positive MSM in San Francisco who had a persistent genital ulcer that ended up being LGV, very similar to this case. Um, and the treatment, just to reiterate, is Doxy 100 twice daily for 21 days. There's my summary. I think we've been over it all. <laughs>